Hi there, Ham Nation folks. Tonight we're going to look at high frequency antennas. And you know, as a technician class operator, beginner operators also have a portion of HF that they can roll mobile, such as the 10 meter band, 28.3 to 28.5, 15, 40, and 75 if you pound a little bit of brass. General class, you've got every single band on HF, and extra class, you've got extra elbow room on each of the HF bands. But let's take a look and see what it takes to go mobile with mobile antennas on high frequency. And what we're going to try and do is to eliminate the need for a manual antenna tuner, but rather we're going to work on the mobile feed point. So let's go outside and take a look and see what it takes to light off HF and enjoy those great privileges while mobile with mobile HF antennas. Before we start playing high frequency mobile antennas, always have protective eyewear. That way when you're fiddling around with these sharp objects, you won't get one right in the eyeball. And Today we're going to take a look at mobile HF antennas of many different varieties. Some are center loaded with a big white coil. Others may be helical loaded with a stainless steel stinger on top. Yet others may be top loaded with a helical wind on top. We're going to see how to mount this gaggle of antennas on your mobile unit. You need to have some adequate test gear. It doesn't have to be hundreds of dollars worth, but we've got some gear here that you probably have hanging around your shack. First item, a continuity meter. Simple volt ohm meter. Make sure your batteries are fresh. Next item, we're going to be talking about a variety of mounts and which one is going to give us the best feed point impedance. Next item, you might need it, you might not, and that is the impedance matching bridge. This one is a capacity bridge. This one is an inductive bridge with a toroidal inductor. Next, you're going to need to have an Allen wrench to loosen up the whip tips for precise frequency adjustment. Be cautious though, don't over tighten them or else you're going to strip out the soft threads that we find on some of the adjustment screws. Next item, if you have it, a little portable HF radio. This one's popular by Yezu. The Ellicraft has a wonderful portable that you can also use for testing. Battery operated, like the Ellicraft, so that way you can tell if you've got a good hot antenna. Next item, a wrench to be able to adjust the feed point. Next, a battery to go along with the MFJ SWR analyzer. And this analyzer is probably going to be one of your most important tools to be able to check the resonance of your antenna without having to actually go to your rig and transmit a signal on the air. But because you'll be using it a lot, I recommend the external battery and that plugs into Anderson connectors and that way with the MFJ bridge you are on the air for your entire testing process. And finally, you might want to have different types of feed point screw on assemblies for the antennas and here are a couple of varieties, the L bracket as well as uh, this little volcano mount that seems to work well and of course good coax for our antenna testing. Here's the yellow dune buggy L bracket mount and yes the hose clamp does provide a good DC ground to the roll bar. Here's the Comvan K400 diamond mount on a door frame and yes the door is well DC grounded. Here's the tripod mount. This didn't work worth a hoot. Here's the roof rack mount, and this too was a terrible feed point performer. Julian and Hannah's red car mount, my favorite, trunk lid. 
This is the popular K400 mount from Diamond, and it takes the popular 3H24 threaded adapter plus the little tiny cable that you can see that won't get squashed when we close the trunk. The mount is affixed to either a vertical or a horizontal surface by four very well manufactured Allen screws that won't strip out. And you actually dog the Allen screws all the way into the metal to make sure that the mount is well DC grounded. Let's make sure that the trunk lid is well grounded to the rest of the chassis. One end of our lead is to the chassis ground, next is to one of these screws, and yes, look at the meter, 0.3 tenths of an ohm resistance, so we're well grounded. The Diamond K400 can be articulated this way, this way, almost any way you need to place it so the antenna is absolutely vertical. Nice small RG174 coax. We want to make sure we don't pinch the coax, and there's a little notch for it here. But most important, before you close the trunk lid and you've got this all mounted, take a look at this. Julian, oh no, Julian, your brand new red car, if Hannah sees that, Julian, you're in deep trouble because what occurs is as we close that trunk lid, we did not see that this is going to put a little gouge there. So many times on the K400 mount, this little part here that provides stability, it's got a little rubber back to it, you may need to bend it up just a little bit with a pair of pliers so when you close the trunk, you don't create a Julian scratch. All right, we've routed the coax all the way through to where the radio is going to be. We've got our MFJ SWR analyzer tuned in to seven megs. Let's go ahead and put on our 40 meter whip. And you know, um, Lakeview, from what we understand, is no longer making the 40 meter whip, so you may need to look around. This one's from Pro-Am. We also have MFJ and also, uh, workmen make these uh, great little helical wound center loaded whips. You'll notice that the whip will screw right into the mount. And now, with this great mounting, let's go ahead and see what the SWR looks like. I don't have this screwed all the way in. You don't need to for our first SWR check. We have our 40 meter antenna on the L bracket here in the dune buggy and as you can tell the L bracket is a little on the thin side so I would normally not recommend uh, this thin of an L bracket. Let's do a reality check and add the coax and it, you should hear the volume come up if everything is working properly. Oh yeah. And we'll tune around now after I got the antenna on there. And as I slide my hand up and down the whip, hear how that noise comes and goes away. The noise comes and goes away when I put my hand on the actual coil. This means that I've got a good active piece of coax, a good active antenna. Now let's take a look at the standing wave ratio. All right, let's take a look for the SWR dip. We're down here at the bottom of the band, 6.9, up to 7. Whoa, here's the dip. More than 3 to 1, not acceptable. This is an impedance matching device, and this is adding shunt capacity across the antenna. I'm going to go to uh, one of the settings here, and now let's take a look and see what the SWR dip is. Still not a good dip. Go to another setting. Still not a good dip. Let's try this setting right here. Whoa! That's what I'm looking for. See that nice sharp dip right there. Here we are directly coupled to the HF whip antenna for 40 meters, just a very short coupling coax. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what the SWR would be with a K400 mount on a vertical surface. This is fiberglass above the mount, so it should drop in, we hope. And, whoa, take a look at that. 
three to one, you see the dip, so we see where the antenna is resonant. But wow, look at our impedance down to about 10 ohms. So looks like we're going to need that impedance matcher one more time. Let's see if we can get it to work to take out the reactants on this particular antenna. We're now working with the MFJ inductance, shunt inductance box, and as you can see that dip is still not satisfactory. Let's add more inductance, it gets a little better. Let's add one more amount of inductance, better yet, add more and now let's go to full inductance and yes, not a bad match at all, down about 1.4 to 1 and pretty darn acceptable for an HF antenna. Again, we're resonant this time on 7296 at the top of the band. This will be fine. This is your typical light bar and it's a favorite among hams to mount antennas on the light bar so when you sell the vehicle, which I'll never do to the 76 wagon, um, you'll be able to take your antennas with you. The problem is with the HF antenna mounted right here, there is so much capacity between the feed point and the metal of the vehicle. Even though the light bar is well grounded, you won't be able to overcome it with any type of antenna bridge. So this is not a good spot for HF. It's fine for VHF, but for high frequency, forget about trying to mount it on a light bar where there's one or two inches between the bar and the metal body of the vehicle. Here's the Diamond K400 trunk lid mount that needs absolutely no further adjustment for the feed point impedance. Notice that it's well grounded to the trunk lid. The trunk lid, when the lid is closed, is well grounded. I've moved up this little point here so I don't put a scratch in the vehicle like Julian did. And again, this mount articulates in many different directions and it's a perfect 50 ohm match because notice how all of the metal slopes away below the whip. All right, be cautious of this mount in that this brass is simply pressed into the bottom of the SO239. We put the mount together like this. Don't forget the plastic insert. This keeps the hot part from shorting out. And again, be careful that this mount can only accommodate fairly lightweight ham whips and as we screw this down make sure that the plastic perfectly separates the hot from the outside metal of the mount. Again a great mount for mounting on a all-terrain vehicle nice and heavy but the downside is a big antenna can actually yank right out from this mount. Once you have found the 50 ohms impedance match, either by a transceiver's built-in automatic antenna tuner or with the impedance matching devices, it's now time to actually tune that low SWR to a specific operating frequency. If you pull the whip out by loosening up these set screws, you'll go lower in frequency and about one inch for every 100 kilohertz, no matter what band you're on. If you push the whip in, you're going to go higher in resonance, higher in frequency, but you're going to find that the whip bottoms out, and it's bottoming out on where the windings go through the fiberglass shaft. So very important that you never force the whip down below where it penetrates the fiberglass shaft or you're going to break the inside winding wires. So be very, very cautious that you don't start off with a whip too long and jam it down because you'll break the entire wire assembly that's part of the winding in the high frequency whip. So get started on HF with a lightweight ham whip that you can mount on a Diamond K400 mount or any type of hatch mount or angle bracket. But once you've been on HF for maybe six months to a year, you may want to consider an antenna with higher Q, which means a larger coil, maybe motorized, maybe a capacity hat, but we'll talk about those a little bit later. And you know, on the air, on 10, 15, 20, 
and even 40 meters, you really can't tell a huge difference between the little $25 ham whip and this more expensive three to $500 big coil whip. But if you do 75 meters, you may want to be thinking about Mobile with the big boys. But for right now, the little lightweight $25 ham sticks will do you just fine. So the key to good 50 ohm impedance is to mount this mount up high on your vehicle, either on a trunk lid or on a door where the mount is vertical, but you can articulate it so that the whip is straight up and down. And if you get it up nice and high on the vehicle, chances are you will not need to use your automatic antenna tuner inside the mobile rig, nor will you need to put this up near the vehicle to get the optimum feed point impedance. So have fun with high frequency mobile, and we'll look forward to hearing you on the bands soon. 73.